bunch of family based acts. I'll be in the second chapter. I'll read down to verse number one, and we're going to go down to five. And I'll probably skip down towards the end of the chapter throughout my teaching this morning, and I'm going to go some other places in scripture as well. Uh, once you finally say amen. amen. All right, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Say one accord, one, accord. one place. One place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat down upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Verse 5 says, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Somebody say, I'm born in. I'm born in. Right. So usually around this time, or this text that we were preached, this would be, you know, right after Easter. You know, we would talk about Pentecost, and we would talk about shit and resurrection. After Resurrection Sunday, about 50 days out, we see Pentecost. And um, around in our time, in our calendar, we would spend that time just talking about God and talking about the outpouring of heaven. But this was a promise fulfilled. This was a promise fulfilled that was given to Peter on the side of a boat. Luke chapter 5 talks about Peter partnering with Jesus on the side of the boat. And uh, towards the end of their transaction, he gave them a promise. And, he, and we all know the story how the fish jumped on the boat. And we all know the story how he threw his neck and the nets began to break. But the pivotal part of that promise was that I'm going to make you a fisher of men. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And we see with the life of Peter similar issues and situations in our own lives. We see where we wanted to give up. We see where we wanted to throw in the towel. We see great success and victory. I mean, Peter was one that Jesus said himself, you know, flesh and blood didn't tell you this. You had to hear this from the Spirit of God. Split second later, he said, get thee behind me, Satan. So we see similar patterns in our life where we do things well, and then we see patterns in our life where we just mess it all up. And I think, you know, the reality of it all is that God was showing the natural tendency of man and how he can take an ordinary person and do some extraordinary things. Yeah. And I truly believe that in your personal life, you need to accept that as well. That you're going to jack it up sometimes. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to drop the ball. You're going to say and do it wrong. But that does not remove the promise of God off of your life. The only thing that removes the promise off your life if you don't make it to that place of promise. Amen. Peter was one that we can really model ourselves by. Peter was an entrepreneur. Peter partnered with heaven when he had a bad day. He was on the side of a boat and, you know, he was throwing his nets out there and didn't catch anything all night. And we see that when, when Jesus came onto the boat, the fish came onto the boat. So it shows us that even in a low season in our life, even on unemployment, even when we lose the job, the house and the car, that Jesus is still interested with the affairs of our life. Now, without God in us and without him leading God and directing us, this will be the moment in time that we want to give up and push away from the table. Say, I got too much going on. I need to get myself together. I'm just trying to battle some things out. But Jesus is the only one that wants you at those difficult times in your life. Those are the times in your life where people don't want to call you back. They won't text you. They won't have anything to do with you. They'll unfriend you on Facebook. They'll stop dealing with you and cut you off. But that is a time where you have to give God your undivided attention. We celebrate with Pentecost and we celebrate with the mighty Russian land. But how did you get to that point? You get to that point through struggle. You get to that point with pain. And the greatest way that you get people involved in any type of process, they got to get bored in. You got to get bored in. You got to get bored in. You know, just like on your job, that once you've been there long enough and you've bought into the culture, you've bought into the vision, you definitely bought into the paychecks and the compensation that you get. And if you love your job and you deal with some of the crazies that are there and some of the times the boss don't act right, but if you love your job and you definitely love the compensation of it, it's nobody that can pull you from that place. Yeah. The only time that you consider that you don't want to be there is when it gets lopsided in nature or culture and you feel not welcome or not wanted. And the first thing that comes out of your mouth is this. After all I gave this company, after all that I did for this company, I came in early, I stayed late, and y'all got the audacity to write me up. And it's unfair at 
sometimes that jobs and employers don't keep good record of when you do that. When you buy into this thing yeah. and you sit in the sales meeting and they tell you how great you are and they give y'all Chick-fil-A in the morning and donuts and coffee and tell y'all you're just doing an awesome job and you have a bad moment or a bad day and all of that stuff goes out the window yeah. and then you're held accountable for stuff that you got that you gave a grace for with somebody else. It's like the person beside you, I mean, they come late every day, they steal the state where they do all that stuff. <laughs> and as soon as your child gets sick and you call and go through the proper oh, procedure, yeah. they pull you in the office. Listen. It makes you question commitment and loyalty. Yeah. Because at that point in time, you were bought into the process. And then you had an eye-opening, awakening type of thing happen. It made you think, like, how committed are you to me? Yeah. Peter was one that on the side of a boat. Bounced a couple of checks. Was having a bad day at work. Was totally frustrated. I mean, it's one thing to go to work and say you can go home early, you know, and still get paid. We rejoice with that. What about when you've been at work all week and you don't get paid? You know you get paid on Friday. Y'all got that thing where y'all wake up at 11.59 at night because you know you're going to work the box at midnight. You lean over and look at that phone just to make sure that the record deposit goes in. Because you're looking for the time that you put in is deserving of money. So you're looking for that compensation for your commitment and your time that went in. What about Peter who worked all night and didn't get paid? Come on. What about Peter who put in the time but didn't get anything out of it? You yourself, outside of your job, have been in transactions, mm -hmm. relationships, or associations where you have put in and not got anything out of it. Come on. Come on. Ah. You the situations where you committed yourself, you did all that you could, you kept mental notes. Y'all know we do great with keeping mental notes. I just told y'all it was September. It's really fe uh, February. But let, let somebody owe me some money. I don't forget that. I don't forget the and stuff like that. I can have all you want. If that joke owe me $200, it's just going to rise up in me just real quick. <laughs> it's funny how things that are near and dear to our heart will trigger our memory. And we'll be able to itemize every ounce of commitment that we put into a thing. You see it in your relationships when you go through breakups. When you deal with a separation. You think about, man, I put that car in my name. My credit got all jacked up. Because I was committed to a thing that was slipping through my fingers the entire time and I didn't recognize it. Because I was overshadowed with a level of loyalty. And then my heart was broken because the other side didn't fulfill its promise. Jesus recognized that in Peter. He saw that in Peter. He saw that he was devoted. He saw that he was committed. He was just having a bad day. And you need to be reminded that you're going to have bad days. But it does not remove the hand of God from pulling you out of where you are. Thank you, Lord. Don't let a bad day disqualify you from destiny. Then I tell you this. Don't let one bad day. He didn't say he couldn't catch fish. He didn't say he wasn't professional. He had an enterprise. He had a franchise. Well before Subway, he had a franchise. He had the boats. People working for him. He just was having a bad day. Jesus recognized that. And before the right hand of fellowship, before he laid hands on him, before he, he anointed him, before he went to new membership class or anything like that, he stepped into the boat and he told him, launch out into the deep. Now, when greater level of commitments come for you, when you're broken and you hurt, your first thing is, I, I can't do it right now. I've got too much going on. I can't commit to that right now. I got a lot of stuff on my plate. I, 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 matter of fact, you might need to get off the boat. We just disqualify people with this. <laughs> We just push them to the side. I got too much going on. I got these people cleaning these boats and cleaning these nets. And I got these people that's going to come in looking for some money. And they know I ain't caught nothing. And you know how you know we go through those changes. And, but, but listen to me. Despite all of that, he pushed away from the deep. He pushed away from the seashore. He had already activated the promises of God. He had already instilled the preach word that was going to be inside of him at Pentecost. He didn't know it yet. But he trusted Christ enough to partner with him in such a way that protected his future. The problem with us not getting to certain places in God is because we are not born into the process. The way that you get commitment out of people, they have to buy into the process. And this is not Mickey Mouse, sugar on top with sprinkles type of stuff. This is you're going to be broke and still have to produce type of stuff. You're going to lose a job, but I still need you to commit. 
You're going to bounce some checks. It's not going to go ideal, but you need a language for process. You need a language for how it feels and what it, what it feels like in your body and in your mind and to be able to articulate, I ain't got it right now. I know that's bad grammar. I know it is, but usually you don't care about particulars when you're going through. Right. You don't care about grammar. You don't care about dotting I's and crossing T's. You need somebody to understand where you are in this low point. And it won't be other fishermen. It won't even the people that Jesus was preaching to. It was only Christ that stepped into Peter's situation and understood exactly what he was going through. Look what heaven's response was. And you need to pay attention to this. Heaven gave him instructions. He gave him a directive. He told him what to do. Sometimes blessings and breakthroughs and opportunities and access points are leveraged off of instruction. You think you need money? No, you need direction. You think you need a door to open? No, you need instructions. Because instructions are going to try you in your internal parts. It's going to make you process and think like, is it really worth it doing it again? Come on. Is it worth trying again? He said, launch out to the beat. You have now, listen to me, you gave me a platform on the most prized possession that you have. You gave me an opportunity to stand upon something that you built. I didn't have nothing to do with buying these boats, don't know who you owe, but you gave me an opportunity to partner at a place that you had protected. So I want you to go a little bit deeper and I want you to throw your nets on the other side of this boat. Listen. Peter's response is like how our response usually is. Sir, I get it. And I understand. I'm not refuting you at all. I get it. But I've been here all night. I've committed myself to this. I didn't just show up as a fisherman today. I'm a professional at this. Come on now. You're a professional preacher. I'm a professional fisherman. You do well with people, I do well with nets and fish. But you don't understand the disparity and the void and the emptiness in that statement because apparently he did not do well with fish. And a lot of times your expertise can have allow pride to rise up inside of you. You can begin to say, oh, I'm good at this. Prove it. How well are you at it? Because we can reach plateaus with expertise. Oh we can reach plateaus with intelligence. And sometimes you will have to partner with the anointing for all of you. Hey, hey. No degree will get you, but so far. But you're going to need somebody to lay hands on your head to activate something inside of you. That degree, that intelligence won't be able to perform or produce. Yes. And God will bring you to your wits end in what you're familiar with. Oh my God. He will dry up certain seasons in your life yeah. only to get your undivided attention, not to break you, but to launch you into the place where he's called you to be. <laughs> so when you get to that place, you don't refute a fuss with heaven. You buy into the process. And Luke 5 is a very intricate text. And if you look through it, you'll see that Jesus said, throw your nets on, off the boat on the other side. Peter said, listen, I've been here all night, but nevertheless, at your word, uh -huh. I'll throw my net. Come on now. He was a professional fisherman. He had spent all night cleaning his nets. A clean net means a strong net. Yeah. When you drag a net across the bottom of a lake or the sea, it's going to pick up seaweed. It's going to pick up dead things. It's going to pick up coral and all of that stuff. So if you don't clean your nets, it's going to affect the ability for you to catch your next harvest. So, so, so you got to understand the frustration of continuing throwing it and throwing it and throwing it and not getting anything in return. You got to understand the frustration that he was dealing with because he kept on doing it and doing it and doing it and not saying anything in return. So he was trying to build a certain type of level of understanding that you could continue to do a thing and not get a return, but I'll still bless you. I'll still open up the floodgates for you. And I'm going to give you a type of information and instruction that's going to stretch you in such a way that despite you having it, I need to get involved in it. Despite you having everything, you got the business plan, you got the Bible one, two, three, you got the connections and the hookup, but God ain't in it. You're trying to figure out, well, I got all the pieces of the puzzle, but I can't see the big picture. God's not in it. Because when God begins to get in it, hmm. you'll realize 
that I don't even have enough to compare to what he wants to give me. Let me give you a prophetic word real quick. God's going to deal with your infrastructure in this hour. He's going to deal with your infrastructure in this hour. We want the blessing. We want the outpouring. We want the breakthrough. God's going to deal with your ability to have capacity in this hour. That, and the scripture tells us that the fish begin to jump in the boat. God, I know that's right. Yeah. See, even at your weak point, when you ain't prepared for the blessing of God, the blessing of God will overtake you. Yeah. Expose your fallacies. Expose that you really won't prepare. You really won't pray. You really don't deserve it. You really don't need yeah. that capacity to hold it right now. But the blessing of God will move past your limitations and begin to bless your house. And it'll begin to fall on your children. Your children will wake up and say, God told me that he loved you. You don't need to understand what's going on in your life. You don't understand what's going on in your home. People will come to you on your job and buy you lunch. You're trying to figure out why is this happening. Because God's trying to get your undivided attention. And it makes no difference of what you got or how you got it. But when I want to bless you, I move past your limitations. I move past your problems. You ain't got nothing but a GED. But I give you a language as a PhD. The drought that came. Uh -huh. We got this false sense of security. This false sense of I'm straight. You know, I'm good right now. When actuality, the blessings of God will expose that you ain't good. We think the devil's gonna do it. We think the enemy's gonna do it. I'm just under attack. No, you're not. God's trying to bless you. And he's trying to expose to you that nothing that you have can qualify to hold what I want to give you. I've never seen anybody on my day. I got employees. I worked for many of jobs ever since I was 15 years old and eight months working at Kings of India. I have never seen anybody on all my day act like Peter act on payday. There was nobody that behaved the way that he behaved. The Bible says, Peter said, wait a minute, oh wretched man am I? I don't deserve this, oh my God, please leave the boat. I don't even... Why? Listen, listen, listen. Let me say Let's be real. If you know you do payment on Friday and you look at that nice check, they said, I'm going to give you a raise, I'm going to give you some friends' benefits, you get a company car down, and you get all that, give you the key, they give you all your benefits on and stuff, you don't look at it and be like, I don't deserve this. Come on down, come on down. <laughs> I don't deserve this. Give this to her. She, she, she deserves this better than me. You get that little false humility thing like Y'all know that be trying to hold it. Thank you. God bless you. He said God bless you all year long. And you speaking blessings over people. I've been praying for you. I've been feeling it. I mean, I just, it's just a connection here. You know, connection. You're lying. There's no connection. You're just thankful you got a little raise. People's response is, look, I don't even deserve this. Right. The blessing didn't come just to show him what God could do. It came to break the pride off of him. Oh, this is the same. Listen to me. This is the same Christ that rebuked him and said, "Get me behind me, Satan." It's the same Christ that said, "I love all y'all. Thank you for following me. Thank you for being submitted to me." But Peter, you gonna deny me? And there was a chicken, a cock that crowed, that reminded Peter that I done messed up again. He left away cussing and fussing. It was the same Peter that went through all those situations and, 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 and said, Jesus, if that's you, I want to walk on water with you. He said, come on, Peter, you can walk on water. Not a problem at all. As long as Jesus and Peter had eyes on each other, he was great. But as soon as Peter looked at his storm and looked at his situation, he began to sink. Mm. Jesus didn't let him sink. Jesus didn't let him drop, but with a strong hand and a quick hand, Jesus began to pull him up. Yeah. Now brings us to Acts, the second chapter. We see that same man 
go through all of that process, show up with a mic in his hand. Same man who drowned in the water, the same man when the cock crowed, the same man that Jesus rebuked, the same man said, I don't even deserve all of this. He said, it ain't about you deserving. This is heaven's investment in you. It ain't about you. Some of y'all think it's about you. God is really not concerned about you. He's concerned about the promise that's put inside of you, whether you know it or not. He's protecting his investment. He's protecting what he placed inside of you. So some of the stuff that's going on in your life, some of these walls that you're hitting, are only you trying to operate outside of the will of God. But he will reel you back in because there's something inside of you that you might not have recognized yet that's active, that's living, that he won't let you drown, he won't let you disqualify yourself, but he'll bring you to a place that you'll realize that there's something inside of me that heaven is fighting for. <laughs> Acts chapter 2 brings us to a place that through all, all his fallacies, all of his mistakes, all of his letdowns, he still showed up in the upper room. He still showed up at the place of promise. Down towards about the seventh chapter of Luke chapter 5, it, te it tells uh, uh, us that, that Jesus told him, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. It was anchored, time stamped, it was a promise, it was irrefutable. So I'm going to make you a fisher of men. He didn't bring it up no more. He didn't bring it up. He didn't bring up fish. He didn't bring any of that stuff up. He said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell would not prevail. Peter was probably like, I done arrived. I done made it. You know, come on, we're going to do a church plan. He said, no, get thee behind me, Satan. I said, what just happened? I don't even know what just happened. He just said, I was all good. Now I'm buying. I mean, what? I don't know how to take this. But throughout the rebukes, throughout the correction, throughout the failures, throughout the anguish, Throughout, the, the, throughout the, the separation, throughout Judas, throughout Thomas, throughout all of those things, he still showed up for the promise. Yeah. He got to the Pentecost. He got to the upper room. Yeah. He, all he knew was to pray. Yeah. You need certain type of things to give you confirmation. You think the prophetic word of God is just to bring confirmation. If the prophetic word of God was only to bring you confirmation, you could get that through an email. All the prophetic is just to give confirmation. No, it's not. It's to tell you something about your future yeah. to protect you from the death and stuff that the enemy will throw against you today. Because yeah. if he don't give you a hope for a future, some of y'all going to Muslim, you be old Catholic, you wouldn't even understand what God's trying to do. You'll give up on this thing. But because he's anchored you into a place in your future that you're going to have to fight for, it's not a carrot in front of you. He's not trying to tempt you with stuff that won't ever come to pass. But God's going to manifest for you, the promise that he gave you when he met you. It wasn't this old thing where I decided to follow Jesus. No, it was not that in that little red hymnal, page number 10, where you read, I decided to follow Jesus. It was not a song. It was not a conscious decision. You was drunk over somebody's car. You was all in the strip club. You was all in your flesh. You was all in somebody's hotel. But God had to remind you that I got a plan and a promise for your life. to a closer place. Jesus didn't meet Peter on a good day. He met him on a day. He met him on a day. A failure. And despite the masses of people that he was preaching at, despite the other people in the other boat, he still partnered with Peter because he saw a vested thing in his future that he had to give him today. You might not understand it all. There might be certain things spoken over you today for three, four, five years from now. 
but you don't no. buy into this process enough yeah. Yeah. and be able to walk this thing out to say, I know I make mistakes. I'm going to say it wrong, but I'm not giving up. Yeah. <laughs> Once it's been solidified that this is the place and this is the time and these are the people that God has assigned for me, you can't pull me from here even if you try. I don't care if I come in here crawling. I don't care if I'm snotting and crying. I don't care what it looks like, what I got on. All I need is to get in the presence of the Lord. See, you understand something. Peter knew what it felt like to be in the presence of the Lord. He knew what it felt like to sit back and see this man preach and people respond. He knew what it felt like to on a bad day when he was due pay and didn't get money to see Jesus supernaturally imposed into his business the resources that was needed to pay his bills. I don't know about you, but you really deserve an extension on Virginia Power. You got on the phone with the right person and they said, we don't really usually do this type of stuff. You don't even supposed to get this. We can't put you on no budget plan, but we're going to stretch this thing out for you about two more weeks so you can get yourself together. You need to understand what you learn by you go through the process of heaven. He's not trying to break you down, but he's trying to raise you up. Yes. He's trying to show you that something greater inside of you that I'm protecting you for a future day, for a latter day. And if you would just press your way, if you could just make the voting and committed, I'll open up unto you the floodgates of heaven, and I'll begin to pour it out in every area of your life. But I need you born into this process. Yes. yes. Good. I wish, I wish, I wish I could articulate enough how being born into God has yielded me so many open doors and access points. We're a product-driven society, so what we do is we only look at the end result of the thing. Process is not interesting. It's not cute. Process is dirty. It's nasty. It's uncomfortable. It doesn't feel good. You get your face done and your hair done, one process is over. But nobody wants to look at you while you up under that dryer. <laughs> Come on now. You can take selfies when you get that blowout. Right? Get that blowout. You roll like this when the hair is done. Yeah. Why you take that picture when she blow all that stuff out? Why you take that picture while you coming up from under that water? Yeah. I mean, we get to see the real you. I mean, I mean, come on, I'm just going to be honest. I mean, show me some indications that you've been through a process. You know, you know I mean, let me know, you know where we stand. I mean, if your head is short, then when you're done with this song, I'm fine with it. I'm okay. <laughs> just keep it real with people about your process. Stop telling me these fake testimonies about this hang time. Y'all don't even understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to know how you got to that point. Jeez, I'm okay yeah. with a good right. closure, a good lace front. I'm not okay with that. Just keep it real with it, brother. Uh-huh. Let me know what's up. Right, right, right. I'm more interested in how you got to that point. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm more interested in how you got to that place. Because we do it in church, too. We get these testimonies after we get everything straight. Right. Uh-huh. We always get a testimony around tax time. I just thank God. I first want to give an honor to God. Who's the head of my life? And I just thank God for bringing me through a process and bringing me out and open up these doors. The only reason you can say that is because you took three of your cousin kids and put them down his shoulders. You got about six, seven thousand dollars. Then you come out. I just want to give honor to God who's the head of my life. He's not the head of your taxes. go through. I'm, I'm sick and tired yeah. of preaching and hearing preaching from a place of you coming out. No, stay in a little bit longer. <laughs> stay in. You ain't done. Ah. I'm going to tell you a quick story. That's why I love my wife. Let me tell you a quick story. I was so hungry one night, I started to cook some chicken. 
And I put that chicken in that pan and turn that grease up. That grease is extra hot. And I put it in there and I put the little shake and bake stuff. Y'all know how, man, we can't cook. We just try to, if, if it looked like this on the box, I need to look like this on my plate. Didn't I? Didn't I? So I put that shake and bake in there. I put it in the pan. I like my stuff crispy. So it was burnt like nice crispy and see, I was not burnt season on one side. I put it on the other side. Nice and seasoned on that side. I took that chicken out. Bunch of drumsticks. I mean, about seven, eight drumsticks in a night. So I took that thing out and I presented it to my wife and she cut it and that thing started to bleed. I said, <laughs> So disappointed, I was so frustrated, he was hungry, that was the last drumsticks in the freezer, I didn't know what to do, the rice was all hard, and it didn't cook properly, and I just, the only thing that came out good was the Kool-Aid, that was the only thing, they went through the proper steps and process, the rice was messed up, the chicken was messed up, because I did not honor process! It's okay, it's okay. I said, look, we're going to be all right. You know, it was like a blanket statement. We're going to be all right. I love you for you. I mean, don't worry about this stuff. I love you for you. We're product driven. We're offering our people something that are wrong. We're offering people something that looks one way on the outside. We're offering people stuff on a platter, saying, here, eat ye all of it. Mm. And as soon as they touch it, they realize that this thing didn't go all the way through the process. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, we're consuming the things and force-feeding people stuff. Mm. And we know what we was doing over there. Mm. And we want to give out these disclaimers. And, and, and utilize the buddy system and say, it's all right, it's supposed to be like this. No, my mama cooked better than this. Mm -hmm. I ain't never taste nothing like this. And I'm, it's sad because I continue to see people force feeding people stuff that didn't go through the process. And oh I jump and shout about it. Mm -hmm. And you don't find out until the devil has a foothold on your children and you don't know how to respond. Because you've been in Cookie Cutter Baptist Church for the last 20 years. And they don't cast out devils there. They don't go through process there. They are more faithful to give you the doxology after the offering that they are to show you how to walk through a process. Amen. They still smoke cigarettes in the front of the church. The demon boy still runs the church. And you don't want to detach yourself because everybody in your family been there. And everybody goes there. But I'm going to tell you something. You're going to have to unlatch yourself to these legal loyalties that God showed you how to live. Showed up at the cross, ran back with the testimony. He's alive and he's arisen. I see an angel, stone rolled away. He's alive, he's alive and he's arisen. They all convene in the upper room. They want the ladies this time. It was that one. I feel like preaching now. It was that one. It was that one who dropped the ball. It was that one who made the mistake. It was that one who was a professional cussler. It was that one who said it wrong and did it wrong. It was that one that went throughout the process and still got it wrong. It was that one that was betrayed and frustrated. It was that one who carried the weight and the blame and all of this stuff. It was that one that the Holy Ghost began to rise up inside of them and they were reminded. Ah! They weren't reminded just when the cock began to crow. They weren't reminded when Jesus began to rebuke them. He wasn't reminded of just he was sinking in the water when he asked to come out the boat. But he was reminded of a promise. 
reconcile and anchor him into a process that brought him to his present day. And he was reminded that God told me through Christ that I was going to be a fisher of men. Hadn't tried it out before. It was really his test run. But he said, hold up, let me try this thing on out. I feel glorious wrapped all around me. I feel a mighty rush of wind. And I might not talk right. I might say it wrong. But I'm going to open up my mouth and I'm going to preach this gospel. And I don't know about you today, but we need real preachers to open up their mouth and decree and declare that for God we live and for God we die. This comes the preacher. We are preachers that's going to be honest with you and tell you the truth. They tell you we ain't Feel like doing it right now, but I'm born into the process. Yeah. 
I done bumped against the wall like a pinball in a game, but I'm bought into the process. Jesus. I will not give up. Mm. I won't turn back. And failure is not right. an, an option. option. I gotta get yes. to the place of promise. The fight was on you this morning. Lift your hands. Mm. God trying to get you to a place of promise. Yes. You won't be distracted not just by people, by your own failures along the way. Okay. Stay, stay steadfast to the process of heaven. Yes. He's setting something up for you. <laughs> there will be time stamped in history. Thank you, you won't be one of those that will be known for your mistakes and giving up and quitting. Hmm. But you will be known for falling short and <laughs> getting back up. Yes. Making a mistake and getting back up. Thank not saying it right and not doing it right. But I get back up. God's going to bless you because you had a heart and a mind to get back up and be about your father's business. Jesus. If that's you today, I want you to come to this altar. I want to pray for you. I want you to come to this altar and I want to pray for you. It hasn't been ideal. It hasn't been easy. It hasn't been a bed of roses. You threw the business plan out the window a long time ago. You had it your way. You thought it was going to be this way. No, it didn't happen that way. I want you to lift your hands around this altar this morning. If your hand is lifted, know this without a shadow of a doubt that God is going to bless you through this process. The impartation for this morning is to get you to Pentecost. I don't care if we have to drag you there. I don't care if we have to lift up and carry you there. Do not give up midway through the process. So what? You went through it one time and it didn't work. So what? You tried it and it failed. Do not give up. Don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. Don't be Judas. Don't be Thomas. God is trying to raise up a Peter this morning. He's trying to raise up a Peter this morning. He met you at a very dry place, a very difficult place. He met you at a place where nothing was going right in your life. That's where he knew he could get your undivided attention. So with your hands lifted today, we're in this process. My prayer for you is you make it through the process. Make it through this process. Ah, the Spirit of God is upon you. And He's called you to preach this gospel. When you quench this thing, you've held it down and you bought the love. But you're now in an environment where you can be yourself. You're going to be like a bull in a china shop. You got so much bottle up inside of you. God's going to raise you up. There's going to be a balance in your mouth. There's going to be a ferocious, roaring lion that's going to come out of you. You felt like you've been muzzled and restricted, but the limitations are being broken off of your life. The limitations are being broken off of your mind. You've been so misunderstood that he needed you to feel that way. He needed you to feel that way. But hear me as I be a man of God. Your hour has come. And God's going to fill you with his spirit to preach this gospel. People see it on you, but you don't see it on yourself. You try to give me it all somewhere else. But woman of God, it's your hour. You're the Peter. You are the Peter. Oh, you will continue to go through process. But it's the process that's going to perfect you. Because what he's called you to do is not going to be limited just to the four walls of the church. But he said, I'm going to release you and shrink you. And I'm going to put you into places. And it's going to be great revival because of you. And I'm going to call to the government up south, east, and the west. And I'm going to give you a word, woman of God. And you will prophesy to the winds and the waves. Ah, and I speak over your life. And I speak over your heart. That you go to this season to be edified and raised up. There were many that contradicted this move. There were many that questioned it. But this is the Lord's steward. And he is well. You've got such a peace that passes all understanding. I prophesy to your life right now that the dreams intensify, that vision intensify, that you can get peace with it. God says, I'm going to visit her even yet again, and I'm going to give her and remind her of what I spoke to her. And you felt claustrophobic in your spirit. You felt so bound in your spirit. But God's about to release you and let you walk into what he called you to be. You are honored. You are celebrated. And I endorse upon your life or anointing to hear from heaven and heaven 
demonstrate. He will come and articulate. There won't be any restrictions over you any longer over to God. But you are loved and appreciated. I speak the blessing of God over her heart and over her mind right now. And even in this hour, it seems like you're in a valley of decision. You don't know which way to go, left or right. It's become a great betrayal that has happened into your life. You slipped into the 2017. It was no big momentum thing. It wasn't anything. You just kind of crossed all over. God says, I brought you to a dry place to fill you yet again. And you don't even understand all that God has predestined for you to do. And people look at you and be like, she always got it. And things are always happening for her. But they don't understand how you cry yourself to sleep. And it's even difficult for you to even present yourself day by day. But God's going to break off of you. People that think you no good. So don't think that it's strange or hard. But God's got a thing set up for you. And everybody has to be an honest to go in. You gotta go by yourself. And that's hard for you. Because you like to feel the accompany of other people. But God says, this one right here is for you. Accept it. Don't water it down. Don't try to give me it all. I hate this upon your life. God knows it is upon your life. You don't keep it on the back. You keep the last word. And God's gonna use that. Instructions. I supply your 